Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Rosa and Rubini podcast, Making Sense of This World. My name is Manas Chavla, and as always, I'm really pleased to be joined by CEO and Head of Research, Bernala Rosa. This week, we're discussing uh, major central banks that are set to begin a new phase in their cycle. Uh, the April-May cycle of the major central bank meetings uh, concluded last week with the big Bank of England meeting. Uh, and we're going to sort of discuss some of the actions that these major central banks have taken, starting with the Bank of England. Uh, Brunello, tell me more about, you know, the last few months of the Bank of England's trajectory uh, and sort of what it's set to do in the future. Yeah, so as we said in a couple of occasions before, central banks have been increasing rates for a very long time now, starting in 2022. Uh, around the middle of the end of 2023, most of them start to close. And then, as it happens in the cycle, after a hiking pausing, then there's the beginning of an easing cycle. So, we are clearly at the beginning of that phase. Uh, some central banks uh, have already uh, stopped rates, particularly the Swedish uh, Riks Bank. Um, and then the um, Swiss National Bank, which is in fact the first G10 central bank in cutting rates um, uh, in this cycle. Then there's the Bank of England, the latest uh, in the major uh, central banks that effectively uh, held its uh, May FTC uh, meeting. And as it happened, every quarter, May, August, November, February, the um, monetary policy report was also issued with a new set of forecasts. Now, given this new set of forecasts, it is quite clear that if rates remain at this level, uh, the uh, Bank of England will undershoot the target by the end of the forecast horizon, which by implication means they are ready or they should cut rates. Um, the question is when. Now we have a full discussion in the review. We have no time to go through that. Um, but uh, uh, effectively, there are two plans. There's the Andrew Bailey camp, the governor, who believes that probably rates may be cut by June. And there's the Hugh Peel camp, the chief economist, who thinks not rates. May, shouldn't be cut before August at the earliest. Which one will prevail? We'll see. Uh, and there will be a resulting uh, uh, decision anyway, because um, there are still quite a few NPC members that are not ready to raise in June. And if it wasn't enough, the uh, number of inflation on which the decision will be made will be part just the day before the MPC, which means that making a prediction today regarding June is like effectively flipping a coin. If inflation uh, goes down in May, as is expected, and then again in June, probably by the 20th of June, the MPC would be ready to cut. If otherwise, um, uh, inflation remains relatively sticky, they would probably postpone to August. And then on the other hand, in, in Europe, um, sort of a similar calculus is being discussed, uh, potentially with different outcomes. I mean, what's what's happening uh, on the, sort of the state of the European Central Bank? Yeah, so still in Europe. So we discussed SMB, we discussed Riks Bank, we discussed Bank of England, but of course the big one is the ECB. The ECB instead is ready to cut rates in uh, June. We can consider this to be a fata complete. And I would say that uh, also a few more cuts during the year, September and December, could be considered effectively done deals unless something really surprising happens between now and then. So the real battle is not about June, September, and December, but, but, but about uh, mm. cuts in intermeeting uh, kind of periods, so between one set of forecasts and the next. And so effectively July and October. So the big debate is about the July cut. Um, at the moment, there's no majority for the July cut. The new information that could be revealed between June and July might be not enough to justify another cut. 
by you know again uh, all central banks are data dependent uh, they will look uh, at all the available uh, set of data communication matters so when you put all these things together they will come up with the decision because of now July is not uh, a given it may become but it's way too early to say yeah. And then on the other side of the pond, we've got the Federal Reserve. We've heard the message of higher for longer consistently for the last uh, you know, few weeks or months. Uh, is that something that will prevail still, do you think? Yeah, the Fed uh, is not ready to cut rates at all. Um, they were until inflation was slowing and labor markets is seen softening. But um, the last few figures on growth, on inflation, on labor market, we're all in the strong side. So the Fed has really no room to cut rates and they will need to wait July, September, November. These are the days that have been talked about. Um, July may be a bit early. September might be rise, but it's just before the election. Do they want to be accused of helping President Biden? God knows if uh, they're going to do that. The good thing is that the following FOMC meeting is the day is a couple of days after the election. So effectively, at that point, the political argument is over, but it could be also be late in the year. So uh, there's lots to ponder on the on, on regarding the Fed. Point is, they are not going to catch for a few more more months. Yeah. And finishing this world tour, uh, let's look at the Bank of Japan. I mean, I have a feeling the Bank of Japan is always the odd one out. Uh, what is the BOJ doing? Yeah, it's always uh, in this peculiar position because structurally they are totally different from anyone else. They've been suffering deflation for the best part of the last 30 years. So now that they saw finally some inflation, they are willing to let it run for a bit before intervening and try to tame it. Also because they are not convinced at all that this inflation will in fact remain about 2%. Um, and so in March, they did abolish the yield curve control. They did get rid of uh, the negative policy rate, uh, but, um, facility, but then the market expected more. And since this more is not happening, uh, somehow they had an unintended consequence. The yen was supposed to uh, strengthen in the back of these multi measures. Guess what? Instead, it weakened further because the market wanted more tightening that the UGS was ready to deliver. As a result, the yen weakened, and the MOF, the Ministry of Finance, had to intervene in the market repeatedly to try to. Uh, prevent further yen depreciation. They haven't fully and officially confirmed as in, this intervention, but you know, for those who know the market, it was clear it was them. They don't want to confirm also because it was unfortunately hmm, unsuccessful. Why was it unsuccessful? Because effects intervention is always unsuccessful unless you really accompany with a change in the monetary policy trajectory, which the central bank is not ready to do. So, again, we'll need to see and wait for a little bit longer, also because their biggest problem um, when it's about the uh, yen is not the fact that they are not doing enough, it's the fact that the Fed is waiting for longer. So it's not the Japanese leg that's problematic, it's the American leg that's exactly. problematic. And so, um, they can try as much as they want, but if the Fed doesn't start to cut rates, everybody else is in one trouble. So, uh, effectively, that's the moment of their phasing. Yeah, and reinforces sort of how interconnected some of these things are. If you know the Fed isn't going to cut rates until say September, then uh, there's you know definitely more concern about the Japanese yen depreciating in the future. So, still a lot to watch out for. Brunello, as always, thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank you. Until next time.